Good day everyone, I am Dan Jerome Barrera and I'm going to share with you a series of crime causation. Let me start by sharing with you Bible verses of the day. First, from Mark 7 verses 21 to 22, For from within, out of the heart of men, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. From this verse, we can learn that man is a sinner. It is a nature of man to sin, it is a nature of man to commit crimes, because man is born sinner. Out of your, the womb of your mother, since you were still a child, you are already inclined to commit sin and to commit crime. But there is some good news that we can find in Romans chapter 6 to 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have an antidote to sin, an antidote to crime, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you struggling from a certain sin that you cannot give up? Are you struggling from pornography? Are you struggling with envy, anger? Are you struggling with rape, theft? Are you struggling with any form of sin? Then come to Jesus and he will set you free. He will cancel all the curses in your life. and He will break the chains. And you will come loose in front of him. So put your trust in him. Dedicate your life to Jesus. And he will, and he will get you through it. So let us now start discussing the theories of crime. But let me begin by discussing first the building blocks of theories. What is the nature of theory? What are the parts of theory? What are the building blocks of theories? First, what is a theory? When you say a theory, what comes up in your mind right away? A theory is all about explanation of a phenomenon. We have a theory about something because we want to explain that something. That something is a phenomenon. What is a phenomenon? A phenomenon is an occurrence, an event, a happening. Something that occurs, something that happens in this world. And in criminology, we tend, uh, we focus on one particular phenomenon. And that is what we call crime. We, we aim to explain crime in this course. It could be theft, it could be robbery, it could be murder, it could be falsification, it could be plunder, it could be corruption, graft and corruption. It could be, it could be economic sabotage, estafa. All types of crimes we will aim to explain them so here are the building blocks of theories you can learn from the definition earlier that we have some elements of theory so first building block the constructs it answers the question what what concepts are important for explaining a phenomenon what are the concepts or constructs is the other term for concepts Constructs and concepts are interchangeable. What are the concepts if we try to explain crime? Of course, number one concept or construct is crime itself. Crime is a construct. It's a mental definition, definition of a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. So, what else? What if we use poverty? Poverty is a construct. Next, what, is we, what if we use insanity? What if we use... Um, Heredity. These are constructs. These are concepts that we sometimes use to explain crime. Next, building block of theory. Propositions. They answer the how question. How are these concepts related to each other? For example, in my given example, that poverty, poverty and crime, how are they related? So, we can have a, a proposition that poverty increases crime. So we can say that if a place or community is poor, more likely 
it will have more crimes than rich communities. So that's a proposition from a theory. Next, logic. The next building block of theories is logic. It answers the why questions. Why are these concepts related in the first place? How are we sure? How how are we sure that poverty is really related to a particular to a, to a crime? Then we look at the human nature, we look at other circumstances, and we call that the logic of a theory. So constructs, propositions are not enough. We need the logic behind the theory to understand why is this theory plausible? Why is this theory a good explanation of crime? How can we expect that this concept really can that this concept can really explain crime? It can be answered by the logic of the theory about the human nature, the world view, about the human nature, perspectives, and so on and so forth. We'll discuss more about that later and in our discussions of specific theories. Next building block of theories is what we call boundaries. It answers the who, when, and where of theories. Under what circumstances will these concepts and relationships work? In other words, under what circumstances will a theory work? There are theories that are limited in nature. We have specific theories that only apply for, say, uh, corporate crime. Some theories uh, propose theories to explain corporate crime only, environmental crime only, corruption only. But these theories cannot explain murder, cannot explain theft. There are also some theories that are proposed and are applicable in the United States, in Europe only, but they cannot be applied in poor countries or Eastern countries like in our country. So we have these limited theories. But we have also theories that have no boundaries. There are theories that have no boundaries. We call them as general theories. They could be applied in any country. They could be applied across all people, across all cultures, across all crimes. That's why we, we call them as general theories. We'll discuss them later on. For example, let's have the Gutfredson and Hirsky self-control theory of crime. Let's examine the building blocks of their theory. First, the constructs. What are the constructs in their theory? We have crime, we have analogous behavior, and we have self-control. Analogous behavior, these are not crimes, but committed, they are uh, treated as deviants, more of a deviance. They are not crimes, but they violate certain rules or norms, like for example, cheating, um, being absent, always in the class. These are analogous behaviors, drinking, smoking by adolescents so these are analogous behavior analogous similar to crime but not really crime committed by children and we have low self-control so they use these constructs uh, in their theory these are the important constructs in their theory but they have other constructs also like opportunity parenting and so on next propositions what, this is one of the propositions of Gottfriedson and Hirsky. If a person has low self-control, he is more likely to commit crime or analogous behavior. That is a proposition. A proposition is denoted by an if and then. F, uh, if, then. If a person has low self-control, then he is more likely to commit crime and analogous behavior. Next, logic. The logic behind the theory uh, is couched in hedonistic rationality. Gottfriedson and Hirsky viewed man as rational, but myopic, meaning man cannot see the future, or man is nearsighted, short-sighted. They do not. Uh, most criminals, according to Gottfriedson and Hirsky, do not view the future. Do not look at the future. They just uh, live here and now so they are fond of gratification easy gratification easy pleasure that's why they commit crimes 
they have low self-control so universal high motivation to immediate simple pleasures from crime it views crime also they view crime that person and his key view crime as pleasurable that is why a man a man a person who has low self-control is naturally drawn to crime because crime offers some pleasures but only short term and a man who has a low self-control is short-sighted and impulsive they tend to make a decision right away and commit crimes without thinking about the future and the results of the crime they commit next in terms of the boundaries self-control theory has no boundaries because self-control theory is a general theory it aims to explain all crimes in all cultures across all persons and across all crimes all types of crimes so this is how we deconstruct a theory in our in our succeeding discussions of individual theories we'll do things like this we we'll examine the constructs, we'll examine the propositions, the logic behind, and the boundaries of the theory. So here are the components of a theory graphically. We can, we can, we can show it like this. At the theoretical level, this is the theoretical level. Construct A, construct B, the proposition. So construct A is related to construct B, and we have the proposition. Then we have at the empirical level. Here at the top, this is the theoretical or conceptual level. Here at the bottom, this is the empirical level of the components of a theory. A construct at the empirical level is converted into a variable. And the construct B here is converted also into a variable. Here at this side, we call this variable as independent variable. And on this side, we call this as dependent variable because these constructs and variables depend on these variables and we call this independent so these constructs like for example crime crime depends on the level of poverty so that's why it's it's called dependent so it depends on the level of poverty level of self-control level of parenting if self-control is low crime increases if self-control is high crime decreases that's why we call this as dependent it depends on the independent variable here we call the relationship as proposition here hypothesis and we have boundaries here is the boundary of a particular theories but again there are theories that are general in nature they have no boundaries Let's define each of these important terms. Constructs. What are constructs? These are mental definitions of objects or events that can vary. So I said this earlier, crime is a construct. Self-control is a construct. Poverty is a construct. These are constructs of theories. We use constructs at the theoretical level. If a person is poor, then he is more likely or he or she is more likely to commit crimes. So we use, that is a proposition that is using constructs. Proposition are associations postulated between constructs based on the deductive logic if x then y. So here the proposition can be re read as if, const if there is construct A then there is construct B. So in my example, if, if a particular community is poor, very poor, then there will be more likely crimes in that community compared to richer communities. So there is an Fx, then Y proposition. And this structure is the same with hypothesis. If X, then Y. Then we have what we call variables. What are variables? These are characteristics of objects or events. That can take on two or more values so from constructs for example crime that is a general construct here crime but we can have variables what what are the concrete concrete variables of crime we could have murder it is concrete homicide theft we have data about them so we call them as variables they vary in yourself you can have your hair 
skin color we have different skin color number of hair height these are variables either dependent or independent dependent variables are outcomes so here the result of your independent if here we have poverty then most likely here we have crime they are variables that researchers seek to understand explain or predict so we explain the dependent variable or predict or understand what is the dependent variable in criminology these are the crimes and other types of variables independent variables these are thought to influence or at least predict dependent variables here in our example we have poverty we have low self-control we call them as independent variables because they are not dependent on any variable in a model but they we can have other independent variables influencing that variable like poverty poverty can be influenced by other factors but in this model, if we have only poverty and crime, or poverty and theft, poverty and robbery, then poverty is independent of something because we have only this bivariate relationship. There are two variables only involved. Then here we have the independent variable, theft, depending on the level of poverty in a community. Then we have also the so-called hypothesis. Hypothesis, the relationship, showing the relationship between two variables. Empirical formulation of propositions. So if we convert proposition into the empirical level, we call that hypothesis. The empirical formulation of propositions stated as relationships between variables is called hypothesis. So let us examine the theory of Gottfriedson and Hirsky to understand better the theory. At that theoretical level, they propose that if a person has low self-control, he is more likely to commit crime and analogous behavior. In this statement, what is the independent construct? The independent construct is low self-control. And what is the dependent or what are the dependent contract constructs? We have crime and analogous behavior. So in this proposition, the independent construct is low self-control this is this is aimed as the cause treated as the cause and here the crime analogous behavior are treated as the effects of low self-control and at the empirical level to measure low self-control Gottfriedson and Hirsky propose that we could have these variables impulsivity risk-taking short-sightedness because you cannot really see low self-control there are variables that we can see like hair like skin complexion height but there are variables that we cannot see they are latent we cannot see them they are latent impulsivity you cannot see impulsivity you cannot see risk-taking you cannot see short-sightedness you cannot see low self-control but you can measure them by asking a person to answer a particular questionnaire in order to measure this variable impulsivity risk-taking short-sightedness these are proposed variables that could measure low self-control because a person who has low self-control is impulsive is a risk taker is short-sighted they do not look at the future but just here and now for immediate gratification they do not view long term pleasure but short term only then here at the theoretical level we can have crime analogous behavior but at the empirical level to measure crime we have theft robbery deviance cheating for analogous behavior deviance and cheating so that is hypothesis if a person is impulsive he is more likely to cheat so if we convert here the theoretical level proposition into the empirical one into a hypothesis here is the hypothesis if a person is impulsive he is more likely to cheat so because impulsivity is one uh, one indicators of low self-control so again 
impulsivity, risk taking, short sightedness, these are the indicators of low self control. And that's it. That's the building blocks of theories of crime. In our next discussions, you will learn the specific theories of crime by examining their building blocks. Thank you everyone and have a good day and God bless you.